Hashem, we're getting ready for the Tish tomorrow, I see. I'm making a special Tish tomorrow night. How's the Hashem? We have a minhag that we don't listen to music for three weeks. We're going to talk about that. I was like, what? Three weeks? We'll talk about it. We'll talk all about it. If God forbid, Lo Aleinu, somebody passed away. And on the way to the funeral, you're like bumping some, uh, I don't know, whatever they play. <laughs> Would it feel appropriate or not quite? Why not? What's wrong? You're supposed to feel your pain, you know, you're not supposed to drown it out. Music. So sometimes music can enhance and other times music can distract. For so many, music is a distraction, more than it is an enhancement. It's a way of sort of numbing out, dealing with stuff. So for three weeks, we sensitize ourselves. We'll talk more about it tomorrow night, which there will be music. We love music. We play a lot of music as Jews. There's going to be a lot of music tomorrow night. Our dear friend Rabbi Akiva, who knows how to make the, make the beautiful sounds. I feel like sounds from the Beis HaMikdash. And that's sort of going to be our transition from a time of music going into a time of no music. So we'll talk all about that tomorrow night, Mitzvah Shem. The power of our words are extremely strong. We generally don't appreciate how powerful our words are. Our words are mega, mega powerful. When a person makes a nether, which is not a good idea. We basically talk people out of making nethers. Don't make an oath. It says if a person makes an oath, it's like he builds an altar somewhere in a foreign place. And if he actually keeps the oath, it's like he offered a offering on top of that altar. So try to stay away at all costs from oaths. Nowadays, especially because we're very weak in our constitution and our keeping of oaths, but when it comes to an oath, the Torah says, Lo yochel devaroi. Do not profane your word. Meaning if you say you're going to do something, don't profane it by not doing it. Kechol yase. Whatever comes out of your mouth, make sure you do it. Meaning don't profane what you said. And whatever you did say, make sure you do. Which even without an oath, a person should be very, very careful. This is a major Jewish message to the world is own your words. If you say you're going to do something, do it. I mean even little things, like, oh, I'll meet you downstairs in five minutes, bro. And then just space out and don't go. Be careful. If you say that you're going to do something, very important to do it. Stand behind your word. In the olden days, my Zaidi, my grandfather, would always describe, he was in the shmata business. How do they say that? Textiles? Shmata. Shmatas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The shmata business. Sold... Uh, linens and things, to make suits. So he was in the shmata business, and he would travel all across Canada, buying and selling things. And he would go all the way from Toronto to Nova Scotia and to Vancouver and meeting people, setting up deals, getting stuff that they... So oftentimes, if he didn't have the money on hand, he would give his word. And he said, I will pay. And people knew if Jack Cooper said he's going to pay, then he paid. And he would make sure that if he's going to come back on that day across Canada, he would bend over backwards to make sure that he got to that place, to make sure that he paid on time, because for him, his word was everything. And I remember when I was growing up, he was giving me these lessons like, keep to your word. And nowadays we know, like, talk is cheap. But if you can hold on to that 
Kechol ayotzim epiyasa. Whatever comes out of your mouth, do it. Try very, very hard. Bend over backwards to keep your word. Make your word emet. Make your word truth. At least do your very best to. So that's the simple meaning of the verse. Lo yochel devarai. Don't profane your words. Kechol ayotzim epiyasa. Whatever comes out of your mouth, do. I want to tell you something the Kamar Nerebbe said though. He said the same verse, Lo yochel devarai. Lo yochel can mean something else. Lo yochel could also mean like to hope for something. Lo yochel devara means like you're meyachel, you're hoping for something. Don't think that your words are only something that you hope will come true. Don't think that when you say something, I, I hope that this will come true. I know I'm praying for something, but I, I only hope that it will happen. Kechol asher yotzmi piyase, whatever comes in your mouth, it will happen. Yase, it will happen. Don't only think that things that come out of your mouth, lo yochel devara, don't only think what comes out of your mouth, is just saying I hope will happen. Kechol ha yotzmi piyase, things that come out of your mouth will happen. Your words are very powerful. That's why anybody grew up in the playground, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Is it true? No, it's a lie. They lied to you. Words are very hurtful. Words are very powerful. And the Jew teaches the world that your words are very meaningful. Don't play games with your words. They happen. They create reality. Choose your words wisely. And as we're getting into the three weeks now, that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. We spoke yesterday because of Birkas Atayr, we're going to go more into today. And it was destroyed because we were not saying nice things one to the other. We weren't saying nice things to each other. Evil world, words create evil in the world. Be very careful. Careful what you listen to. Careful to the music you listen to. We mentioned this before one time. That sometimes a person grew up listening to different secular music and all of a sudden he becomes religious and he's like still singing like those old tunes, the old ditties. And next thing you know is he's like singing these words and he's like, oh, those are like nasty. I didn't even know. Yeah, most music <laughs> has got some <laughs> weird agenda. But the music kind of just goes in. You don't even realize, you're just like moving to the beat and just saying the words and you realize like, Whoa, I better be more careful with what I'm saying. But when you're in the music, you just kind of get pulled. And you don't realize that you're saying these words. Be careful with what you say. Yes, my friend. If you're saying it, does it like still count as you, you're meaning it? Because you're like singing it. You're not really like, like if you're not conscious of the words you're saying. Yeah, what you say. Like, like if a song says like you swear to like. Him, That's right. Is, is that like bad? Yeah, the, like, yeah. your it. words are powerful. Your words are very powerful. Be careful of your words. Even when said without kavana, they have power to them, because the words are the words. If they're said with intention, then certainly it's even more powerful. So be an observant Jew. Observe the things that you're listening to. Observe the things that you're saying. I know it sounds like a crazy thing. You, got, you ready for something crazy right now? Think before you speak. <laughs> wow, I never thought about that one. Yeah, think before you speak. I'm sorry to say it in such a like terse and just straightforward way. But we oftentimes don't. We just kind of spew. And your words are very powerful. Kachol. I show you it's in piyase. Whatever comes out of your mouth, it's going to create things in the world. Like the maggot said on the Mishnah in Pirke Avos, da, mala malimcha. If a person wants to make sure that he doesn't come to sin, what should he start by doing? You should know, mala malimcha. First, know that Hashem is watching. There's an eye that watches, there's an ear that hears, and all your acts are being written into a book. Yeah, there's books up there that write everything down that are transcribing everything that we're saying right now. Ever seen like uh, what they do if you send your voice is put on a computer and all of a sudden you just see like there's words below there, they're just transcribing it. Sometimes they're a bit funny, the translations. <laughs> like one time I saw Shabbos was like 
Cheruvim, for some reason. I don't know, it turned out Cheruvim. But things are being written down. But Hashem is exact. There's an eye that watches. I remember when I first saw video cameras, and you saw yourself on a video. Oh my goodness, is that me? Like, you, you guys already grew up, but this is like normal. But I grew up in the transition between having no concept of watching yourself on a screen. I grew up in a time that you could record your voice for the first time, Walkmans, and you would hear your voice, and, oh my, where's my voice? Like, what do they do? Like, I said that, like, that was then. How am I playing it now? The recording stuff. I don't mean the commies. I mean God. <laughs> Hashem is recording. Hashem is going to ask us about all the things that we said. And we have to be able to own up to that. So da, mala, mala, you know what's above? Mimcha, you're causing it. Whatever is above is mimcha, is from you. You're causing whatever's going to be above and then flow down to this world. Okay, that was just a bit of a chizuk on the power of our words and choosing our words wisely. So we're learning about ways to fix. The, yes, Tavi. So if somebody asks you something, I've seen some Orthodox people do this before, like this. If there's a conversation going on, like somebody gets asked something, I've noticed sometimes somebody just won't say anything. Like they'll just sit and they'll just, like they don't want to, clearly they don't want to say whatever, they don't want to continue in the conversation, but like they don't want to be rude either and tell them let's not talk about this, but they just sit in silence until the conversation kind of just shifts to something else. Is that like something that you would recommend or is that like too social there's awkward? A, a great question. There's a lot of laws about not saying evil speech. A lot. The Chavetz Chaim, you know the Chavetz Chaim was? The great sage of the Chavetz Chaim. So he wrote a book called Shmirat Alashon, guarding your tongue. Only saying holy words. And there's a ton of rules. You know, for the Jewish people, you're not even allowed to say nice things about somebody if the people that are listening might think, hey, you know what, you think that guy's really that nice? And it's going to conjure up bad feelings about that person from the people around. And it's going to cause them to say, oh, you think he's the eye? Let me tell you a story about that guy. We have rules, not just libel, we have rules about positive speech for others. Very, very amazing. No other culture has so much detail and delineation of holy speech. It's amazing. There's a major truth that we're here to talk, tell the world is to use your speech in a holy way. So the Chavetz Chaim wrote this masterpiece on the rules of speech. And when it first came out, people thought like, oh my goodness, there's so many rules, like there's nothing to talk about. Like, how do you even talk? So they were going to go visit the Chavetz Chaim and they imagined him like he would just sit there like this. Because what do you say? It might be evil speech. You've got to be careful. You just better not say anything. So they came and they traveled very, very far to Poland, to Radin, to go see the Chavetz Chaim. And when they came to the Chavetz Chaim, what did they notice? The Chavetz Chaim silent in his chair, nodding. To the contrary, they noticed the Chavetz Chaim was speaking like crazy to people, Torah ideas, family things, how you doing, how's work, how's business, how's life, talking a lot, like a lot. So they said, Rebbe, like we read your book, you know, like how do you talk? You know, I thought you can't say anything. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. You didn't read it well enough. If you didn't read my book, you can't talk. Once you read the book and you know what you can talk about, then all we do is talk. Our whole life, for the Jew, it's all about talking holy speech. If you don't read the book, then you probably should stay silent because you don't know what to talk about. But read the book and then talk away. Okay, that's an important halacha, an important story. Remember that story very well. We need to know proper speech. So in the situation you asked, you have to know. If somebody comes up to you and he says, Tavi, he's like, oh, you know, I heard that like Reuven Moshe, I heard him like uh, that he was doing that thing. Like, oh, like, did you hear about it? Like, what do you do? <laughs> so, he's just baiting you. And be careful. And it depends. There are some times when you're allowed to say something negative if it's for a specific benefit. For example, if somebody knows that this guy was dishonest in business, which goes against the Torah, and we, we con condemn that type of behavior. 
And now somebody comes to him and he's like, I was offered by so-and-so to get involved in a, as a partner in a business. I knew that you were a bit, your partners with him some time ago. Can I ask what happened? Why you're not partners anymore? You know, I'm thinking about investing $10 million with him. What do you say? So, well, should you think, well, I don't want to say anything negative, so I'm just not going to tell you that he actually cheated me out of, you know, $5 million. Should you tell that person? Yes. Absolutely. You have to. It's a mitzvah to tell him. You, you, you have to reveal. You want to make sure that this guy doesn't get involved in a bad business deal. But you don't add anything on to it and you tell him, I'm telling you this for your benefit. I'm not adding any embellishment to what happened. I'm just telling you that I was, I was cheated by this person and this is for your benefit. To know that so you don't get involved in, in a bad business deal. It's us, sir, if you know the person won't take their, the advice seriously. It's That's time. right. It's us, sir. It has to be that he's going to receive it. What about if uh, somebody is dating a girl and this girl had something very, very negative? I don't know, like she's, she like, what can I say? <laughs> I don't know. Think of something really bad. She's a serial, no, uh, thief. I wanted something more tame. You know, can, let's not go crazy over here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> She's a serial klepto thief. And, and she, she literally just steals all the time. And you were dating her and you realized like she would steal from you, she would steal from everyone, she'd you'd be in the, in the hotel, she's like stealing stuff, stealing everything. And then the, your buddy is dating her. It's like, can I ask like, do you mind like what happened with that? Like I'm dating this girl, I like her a lot. He didn't notice because she's a good, she's like thiefing everything. His Rolex was gone one time. He's like, I don't know what happened to it. I probably left it at home. Yeah, she's got it. <laughs> so, can I ask, like, what happened? So, should, I, I don't want to say a negative thing, like, should you tell the person? Yes. For sure. You, you don't want a wife who's a serial uh, con artist thief. Right? We're, we're okay with that? You're not saying that she's a horrible human being. You're not saying that her soul is tainted. You're saying that she's got a problem. And it's probably not a good idea to get involved in this relationship. I'm telling this for your benefit. And by the way, you're, you could share this with other people, but you can't go and like put this in a new, you can't, well, if it's going to impact other people, you probably have to get the, her help. But you can't just go and spread evil speech if it doesn't have a purpose. In this case, if somebody is a serial uh, con artist, you might have to warn the larger society as well, but you have to be tactful even how you do that. Yes? What about discussing negative things that people are already aware of? For example, somebody walks in the room now, yells some rude things at us, and leaves. We don't necessarily have to discuss what we all saw happen, but, you know, like, are we allowed to discuss them up to each other? Wow, that was really rude, that was a mean thing that this person did. So, even though the, when things become public information, there's no longer a certain prohibition in saying it, it's not a good idea. Why? Because if you become someone that just says negative things, it taints you. It's tainting on you. Even though people know about it, you don't want to lower your status as a human being. That What do you talk about? Negative things that people know about. You need to use your voice for exalted, holy purposes. And therefore, even though certain things in the Torah might not be prohibited, but it lowers your stature as a dignified person. The most powerful tool you have is the power of your voice. You want to know what the power of Mashiach is going to be? We are taught that the power of Mashiach is going to be, he's not going to fight wars. He's not going to use weapons. The power of Mashiach is going to be his power of his voice. He's going to be the greatest speaker in the world. And he's going to win people's hearts over through his voice. His voice is going to be used for holy, exalted things. Because the power of speech is the most powerful weapon we have. Either to destroy, God forbid, or to build. The voice is so powerful. That's why, what do we do all day in yeshiva? And we invite Yidin all over the world to come and join us in yeshiva. We learn Torah Shabal Peh. We learn the Torah, which is the oral Torah. All day, what do you guys do in yeshiva? You're probably tired. Probably the first couple weeks in yeshiva, you're like, I need some like ricolas. Like my voice is you know, scratchy because you talk all day long in yeshiva. All day long about holy things. It's to purify our voice. And you know who's the master of Torah Shabal Peh? King David. 
He's the master of Torah Shabal Peh. He's the, his weapon is the weapon of speech, of holy speech. That's why he's the Mashiach. Mashiach will use the power of speech to heal the world, to bring the world to an exalted level of consciousness. And we're going, we're following in that way, of using our speech for holy things. I don't need to tell you, and I didn't see it myself, but I, I'm, I'm making a pretty educated guess. You'll tell me if I'm incorrect in my assessment. If you were to go on to just a random feed, just a random TikTok feed, just pick a guy's phone off the street and say, bro, do you mind if I just like, check your TikTok feed? And you were to scroll through the feed and listen to the words that are being used. I have a feeling, I didn't do this, that it's probably not so clean. Mm. Anybody disagree with that assessment? And No, no, it's totally clean, holy words, no cursing, you know, very positive, uh, not putting anybody down. Mm. Have you tried TikTok kids? <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> Even the kids, I wonder, I wonder also if things are, are exalted, if things are holy. We want our children to be holy and exalted. Not like weird holy, like spooky, like with a ca like, <laughs> like white, like, you know, and like capes and candles and like, nor like holy, like righteous, righteous children. Righteous children. Mashiach is going to bring back the righteousness to our speech. He's going to bring back the concept of righteous children. These are exalted things. That's what yeshiva is all about. Become righteous again. Become exalted. Use the power of speech. And exactly during this time of the three weeks, the destruction of the Beis Mikdash was happening through contamination of speech. We want to purify speech. Yes, Tavi. That's a draw us back, but draw us I, back. Let's go. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm the guy asking my friend. About I always want to have that guy. So, so be that guy. About the the business partner that he once had, and he's like, oh, he's not such a good business partner. Isn't it still my duty as a Jewish person to not as oh, take his information and be like, okay, but like I shouldn't make the I shouldn't make the 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 decision in my mind to not do business with him solely because of what even if he's a trusted friend telling me. You have to do your due diligence. You still support. Okay. Of course, everyone has to do due diligence. But if somebody is a good source of information and they were a partner, and you could. I mean, you have to see, maybe this guy's got some vendetta against him and he's like smearing his name. So that's what I mean, due diligence. You have to see, you always have to take things with a grain of salt. Maybe it's not true. But if you have evidence that this person swindled this guy out of five million dollars and you're going to him, in, bless you, in confidence to help you make a good decision because you're thinking he asked you to be his business partner and give him ten million dollars, well, make sure you do your due diligence and ascertain if this is going to be a, a smart decision. We don't respect uh, naiveness. The, what do they say? Like, naivety, naivety. is... Yeah, being not... You know, ignorance, uh, ign ignorance is bliss. That is so not Jewish. It's not bliss. I was like the guy, what was the guy in the Matrix? Take the blue pill and just go back to your steak and wine. Cypher. What, the, what happened? Cypher. Cypher, that was the guy? Yeah. Which is like eating the wine, he's like, oh yeah, just give me the blue, yeah, forget about everything. Are we into that guy? We're so not into that guy. He's just like, ignorance is bliss, I don't care, like, I'll just live in the matrix, you know, forget about it. No, 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 if there's a real world, and there's realness and due diligence that has to happen, and there's a problem here, I need to know about it. So do your due diligence, find out. But even when you find out that this person is, has been dishonest in business, or this girl is a klepto uh, thief con artist, ensure that you don't mix up. Her soul might be a good, but she just got a problem. This guy's soul might be good. You're not trying to you know, make hate on his soul. His soul might be good. He's just gotten caught up in horrible business practices, and you should probably feel bad for the guy, and, and definitely not get involved in business. Do your due diligence. Very important. Let us continue. We are learning about 
something we spoke about yesterday, which is that when we make the bracha of Birch Satayra, essentially what we're doing is we're healing why the base of Mictus was destroyed. Now that should be a bit crazy because what do you mean? The base of Mictus was destroyed? The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed because what? We didn't make the blessing before we learned Torah and we lost the divine protection? So what did we say about that? What was the answer to that? The answer was learning Torah is not enough. If Torah learning is just like calculus or trigonometry, that you turn it into just any other subject, like the ancient Greeks told us, not as if I see any Greek letters on that shirt, my dear friend. We have to elevate it. And we're infiltrating a pi. It's infiltration. To elevate the sparks there. And we did mention that you can learn calculus with godly consciousness, but it's hard. If a person, though, makes the app on the phone the same size as everything else, then it's like Torah is like anything else. And therefore, I'm not learning Torah for a relationship with God. I'm learning it because I want to become powerful. I'm learning it because I want to, to do any motivation which is not the right motivation. So what was the sign that we lost the right motivation of learning Torah in the times of the basic makers? Even though everyone was learning, we stopped making Birka Satayra. And Birka Satayra means that I'm learning because I want a relationship with God. I know that sounds crazy, but that's why you're here. We're not just learning Torah because, you know, there's like, you know, Yale, Harvard, Asha Torah, Oxford, Cambridge, you know. And I decided to go like the Jewish one. No, you're learning Torah because here is where you're going to make contact with God, with an intimate relationship with God. And therefore, the learning is to bring you close to God. That's what Birka Zatayra is all about. Are you guys ready to go into the actual text of Birka Zatayra? Any questions? You ready? Let's dive in. Are we allowed to learn Torah without making Birka Zatayra? No. no. We have to make Birka Zatayra first. Is, is that that one? Uh, Run, guys! <laughs> Somebody to make? What's that? Saying, is, it, is it like the, that paragraph with the other br bracha or just the bracha of like uh... There's two brachas we make. Yeah. I have a question to you, even before we begin. What is Birka Zatari? You know the different types of blessings that we make? Who knows what the different types of blessings, categories of blessings are? Well, what, what's the type of blessing on food? Appreciation. Birka Sanenin, the blessing you make on enjoyment. Right? Are you allowed to enjoy anything in this world without asking Hashem for it? You know what that's called? If you, if you eat without making blessings? Stealing. Because this is not yours. Hashem made it all. Hashem is creating it something from nothing right now. Every second. Even if you bought it. Until you link it back to Hashem, it all belongs to Hashem. What happens after you make the blessing? It's totally yours. It's totally yours. It's totally yours. And therefore, making a blessing on food is a powerful way to connect to God. One of the most important messages, when I speak to my Rebbe and I say, Rebbe, I'm going to different places to speak, what should I talk about? A main thing he'll say is talk about making blessings. This is for all humanity. All humanity, before you eat food, thank God where it came from. Say, Hashem, thank you so much. God, thank you for this. You gave this to me. This is not just the sweat of my brow and the strength of my hands that made this. You're a partner with God, but without God, there's no bread, there's no nothing. Yes? My question is how often can you make it? Like, let's say like, you only know how to make like, a brook on something and you're not yet making like, the, the after... After blessing? Then like, how would it count? Like, if you're like drinking water, you're saying sh like shakol. Then like, when would you say shakol again? Or when Beautiful. Would that question is beyond the scope of today. There's a good packet from Rabbi Schloss. Rabbi Schloss has great classes on it. That is a question when you get into the base medrash, like the, the hardcore, you know, top tier, Ivy League stuff here. That's when we get into the nitty gritties of those questions. The simple answer, though, just on one foot is you only make a new shahakol when your mind left the original blessing. 
either you change locations or so much time elapsed and it's sort of out of your mind or um, you've kind of separated your consciousness from the eating experience and therefore you'd be obligated to make a new blessing. Yeah? That has its own laws and the laws of making a blessing afterwards have its own laws which the after-blessing laws very much relate to when you digest the food. After the food is digested, you lost the opportunity to make the blessing. It's gone. You make the blessing when you're still satiated from the food. You're feeling like, ah, this is good. So, what's the other type of blessing? There's a blessing called birchas shevach, praising Hashem. Things of, of like, wow. You see a, a beautiful mountain. You see the Alps. Wow, Hashem, amazing. Beautiful. That's called Birchos HaShevach. Wow. We have many such blessings. You see an ocean. You make a blessing. An ocean's amazing. Or wait. Within 30 days, because then it's like it became old. Within 30 days, it's still new. So you don't make a blessing. Then there's another category called Birchos HaMitzvah. A blessing on a mitzvah. Making a blessing on doing a mitzvah. Asher kidesham mitzvotav et sivana litatef bat tzitzit. Tbaran tzitzit. Or tfilin. Or lishmoa kol shofar. Or to blow the shofar. Or al netilat lulav. To shake the dalad minim. The lulav. So what is the blessing of the Torah? Is it birkata mitzvah? Is it Birchas HaShevach? Is it Birchas HaNenen? What do you say? Which category is the mitzvah? It's, I think it's two. Oh yeah, what? Um, I think it's both except for the mitzvah. I, I don't know, I don't know. So, is it a Birchas on the mitzvah? Bless you. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, seemingly yes, because Asher Kiddush on mitzvah, Tavitz even last sok b'divrei Torah. I have to learn Torah. I have to be involved in Torah. Yeah, no it, Torah. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta learn Torah. So this is a mitzvah bracha on the learning. What about birchas shevach? Shevach is like praise. There's an element of praise. Hashem, you gave us the Torah. We're so thankful. Wow. Shechiano is a birchas shevach. What about birchas anenin? A blessing on taste. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, Moshe I knew I was going with this. The sweetness of the So the Mepharshim say that Birchus Atayra is also a type of blessing on taste. How so? Because when you learn Torah, it's so sweet. It's so sweet. You ever learn some stuff, you know what I'm saying? It's like, mmm, some good stuff. That is good stuff. You know, steak is good. But the Torah, it's like, deep, it's sweet, it's sweet stuff. But there's only one question I have for you, my friends. When you make a blessing on eating things, don't you have to make a before blessing and an after blessing? Yes. You do, right? So where are the two blessings? <clears throat> oh, there's two blessings on the Torah. Which one is the before blessing and which one is the after blessing? You need a before blessing and an after blessing. What do you say, my friends? Well, I have a question. There's two brachot, right? La sok b'divrei Torah and va'revna, delicious, sweet, and then asher b'achar banu. Which one is which? What do you guys say? So asher b'achar banu, which is the second bracha you say, is the beginning bracha. Right? What do you do? Which is the second bracha, right? So you say, and what's the second bracha? Asher bani. You chose us Hashem, you gave us the Torah. So the second bracha of Birchas HaTorah is the before blessing on the taste. What do we do right after we say the second blessing? You, you learn. Ah, it's like you take a smoothie, make a shahako, mmm, delicious, right? 
blueberry, acai, goji berries, be careful of the bugs, chia seeds, spirulina, all the good stuff. And you enjoy it. So where's the after bracha? The after bracha is the first bracha we made. Shouldn't you make the after bracha like when you finish learning? Oh, uh, it never ends. It never ends. But I have a question for you. Just make the bracha like before bed. Meaning I start the day with the Sher Bachar Banu and then I make the La Sobe Divrei Torah sometime later in the day. So the answer is you can't do that. Why? Because how much Torah do I need to learn? All of it. And then how, how much of the day do I need to learn it? Every second of the day. Which means, do I even have time to say the after bracha before I go to bed? No, because I really need to go to bed with Torah. I can't stop. I have to fall asleep with Torah. So what's the only time that I can make the after bracha on Torah? So, but, so if you could when you're sleeping, fine. But the next available time is when you wake up in the morning. Ah, but what do you mean? Does that mean that I'm not learning when I'm sleeping? No, you are learning when you're sleeping. If you have kavanah, you can go and learn things up in Shemayim. That stay in Isha Torah for a little while longer. And we'll get into that. Have a wonderful day. We should be zakhdim. Amen. 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 Amen.